Good morning, good, after good afternoon, depending on where you are around the planet. Uh, this is welcome in this virtual new world. And, um, but we will discuss uh, what's different, as uh, Erika said, what, what's different going forward. Perspectives and academic and research institution leader will have a chance to, to express their vision on the long term. So we'll share the moderation with uh, uh, Michel, Michel Weigman from the GCSE, our partner for this, uh, uh, for the organization of this um, uh, symposium. And um, so we, we thought that for this last and final session, it would be a good idea just to be both of us, just to show that the partnership we had so far. But I would like to say a few words just to introduce the subject of, uh, of this last session. Um, and yesterday I heard somebody saying that our planet is facing existential challenges. And I like this um, existential challenges world. Um, with its sustainable development goals, the United Nations calls for action. Uh, environmental issues are behind most of these 17 SDGs. And every country, every organization or industry, as well as every individual, should get mobilized to preserve the future of the planet. That's the message. So what do we observe? What did we observe lately? Is that very recently, in April 22nd, several national leaders marked the 50th uh, anniversary of Earth Day. Uh, no, the 50th Earth Day by announcing uh, increased ambition with their National Determined Commitment, NDC. More recently, I mean, last month, last year, several multinational corporates, we have seen them announcing with a strong media uh, feedback uh, their intention to achieve uh, carbon neutrality within the framework of ambitious. Uh, objectives, some as earlier as uh, 2030. But the good news emerging from this symposium is that academic and research communities are also engaged. So far, the symposium confirmed that research community in US and France feel very responsible for their carbon and uh, environmental footprint and their own activity on their own activity. Uh, maybe the COVID pandemic has enhanced uh, awareness. In some cases, the crisis has, has accelerated the uh, ecological transition within our organizations. So the, this, uh, very, this, um, the different sessions we had so far during the symposium have been occasion to discuss more specific issues regarding mobility, regarding campus management, regarding research organization and more. It was also an opportunity to share experience, tools, ideas and strategy uh, being deployed within French and US academic communities. This last session aims to look at the future, to take, uh, to, 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 to look at the, subject and the thematic from a different perspective to discuss the academic and research institution and government's long-term strategy. Are we anticipating major changes with our daily research activities? What are the key challenges for institutions and governance? How will we collaborate internationally in 2030-2040? Uh, do we foresee major differences between the approach in France and in the US? Uh, we'll see if our panelists have answers to these very difficult prospective questions. But what is clear is that we already endure uh, acceleration process and transition is on its way. So to start this, uh, to start this, um, uh, this panel, I would like to introduce first our first panelist, Gabriela uh, Pfeiffler. Gabriela, you are you represent the National Council of University President, which is in French named CPU, and more specifically, the subcommittee dedicated to socio-ecological transition within universities. 
Gabriela, you are also chair for Sustainable Development Commission at your university in Toulouse, Toulouse, uh, Toulouse Jean Jaurès University. So I leave you the floor and you can tell us what you do within this uh, organizations and your, your vision. Thank you, Stefan, very much for this uh, introduction to this last panel session of uh, the symposium, uh, which I have the huge pleasure to participate in uh, together with Joni, Jill, Oliver, and a lot of other people I had just had a quick look at in the last uh, two days. Good morning, good afternoon, everybody on any sides of the Atlantic Sea, actually. So I have the privilege to be the first one to share the vision of the future. Um, which vision I'm sharing? Well, it, it depends on the role I'm, I'm in, endorsing here. I'm the spokesperson for the Committee on Socio-Ecological Transition, as you said, for the French CPU. Before telling you what is really important for us, I think I have to make some points on the CPU and what is the CPU doing actually, because it is a kind of a particular singular uh, association of university presidents, which has no direct power or this, this decisive power, actually. So um, there are 74 French universities, which means over 1,600,000 students and a total staff of over 200,000 persons. So you already imagine that, okay, this CPU may bring together a lot of people and that means that we can spread a lot of ideas. Uh, it exists since 1971 and there's a non-profit organization since 2008. So the members are all of the university presidents plus some other public higher education and research institutions, uh, French higher education research institutions. And all of those presidents are elected in their home institutions. They are elected for four years, what means that in the CPU, you have a lot of turnover actually. So it's not something that is uh, resting for uh, four years, five years and working all the time together with the same people, but you have to change what brings in new ideas too. And this is a good thing because it mixes a lot and it's, uh, it's going to, well, it, it, it reflects the re reality of uh, higher education uh, governance in France, actually. So what is the role of the CPU? It's being uh, kind of advocating, negotiating with gov governmental authorities, higher re education research networks, economic social partners, national, international institutions, and promoting French academia and values at home and abroad. So. It's also giving advice and designing potential pathways according to a vision we might call shared beyond, uh, amongst the, those present, this present, those presidents. But we do not have not have a direct influence on public authorities. Yeah? So this is very important because there is no decisive power actually. Um, well. We are organized to work together in thematic committees, as for instance, one on training and employment prospects, on research and innovation and so on. The committee I am uh, I belong to as a uh, referent, not as a president, is the uh, Committee on so Socio-Ecological Transition. Uh, this committee is shared by the president of the University of Clermont-Auvergne who is called Matthias Bernard. And sustainability is, of course, at the heart of this committee and its interests, its special interests. Sustainability, as we understand it in this committee, is, uh, means more than just ecological uh, sustainability. It includes social aspects and actually it is uh, strongly linked to the 17 SDGs. Well, as a consultative organization, the CPU also is uh, permanently present in Brussels. You know that in Europe, Brussels is the place to be if you want to have uh, some uh, possibility of uh, influencing, shaping, advising, being present in uh, what will happen in the research agenda on the European, uh, research and political agenda in the, in the European context. 
And uh, CPU also advises the French lower and upper houses of parliament. So we have uh, permanent uh, advisors uh, dedicated to this, actually. Uh, the other way around, the C CPO also acts as a facilitator for research and innovations on sustainability, cooperating with other public institutions like, for, for instance, the Institute, the IRD, which uh, Olivier will tell us about, uh, the CNRS, which is the big research institution in, in France, uh, by, well, founding, sustaining, uh, putting into place, uh, for instance, research alliances. So we have one that is called Al Onovi, which is on environmental uh, sustainability. Then we are also participating in a think tank called Unilab on uh, the 17 SDGs and the French Agenda 2030. In a more practical part, the CPU also advises universities by sharing their vision and good practice. For instance, in 2018, so it's not that old, but it's before the pandemic, the CPU co-edited a guideline handbook for uh, uh, any university uh, based on uh, good practices for integrating SDG goals, SDG and sustainability in uh, all of the professional uh, domains that, uh, that you may find in, in universities, actually. So it goes from strategic management to teaching, and you even have some, some paragraphs on catering services and all this on the university uh, grants. So the, let me come to the Committee for Socio-Ecological Transition. It exists since 10 years, 11 years now. Uh, there are 15 presidents of universities uh, participating in this committee, all sharing a particular interest in sustain sustainability. Uh, the presidents actually select themselves into the committees they are working in. Right? So it's, it's really a self-interest to, to go there. And the committee animates a, a network of about 250 persons like me in charge of uh, sustainable development and societal responsibilities. So there are lecturers, researchers, administrative staff in all of the universities of France. Well, the committee's priority for the period 21-22 actually uh, is threefold, and I will come back to this uh, threefold pri priority. The first thing is that we would like to um, have a have a, the university campuses become like uh, innovation demonstrators of sustainability. It's starting with, of course, with low energy, zero greenhouse gas emission of campus buildings. But the objective, the final objective, brings in a more systemic view, including novel ways of using work and li life space or living space, of offering better working, teaching, and learning conditions, and of integrating those spatial in the social those spaces in the social environment, so in the cities that are around us. It, it is also a kind of a part of the self-understanding we have as universities included in an environment. Uh, the second uh, prior priority would be to integrate issues on objectives of uh, sustainability in any academic education pathway in terms of content and methods. So what we teach and how we teach. It's about capacity building, even if the term capacity building is rather used uh, when it comes to less developed countries. I think it's quite adapted here. And then finally, uh, the committee would is also acting in order to have all higher education research institutions take into account the European and international states in their own sustainable development and social responsibility strategy. That means opening up to what others do and how to network and cooperate in order to have a more sustainable future and vision for the for this future. Well, um, the very, very, very important points. I would uh, speak on some minutes and what did the pandemic do to it? Uh, how did it accelerate the sustainability agenda of universities? If so, how, where? Well, uh, 
first of all, I, I know I should speak rather on research and on political uh, considerations, but I need to start with teaching and training. It's really important for the CPU, the committee. It's a huge part and it, it is more than just giving content or making people learn things. It's enabling them to face the future, so it's capacity building. Uh, one of the French political prior priorities actually is educating, training, teaching every citizen in order to understand issues of sustainability and be able to act accordingly. So uh, the French Minister uh, of Higher Education and Research actually set up a working group on this topic of uh, sustainable development and education, which is chaired by Jean Jouzel, who you might know being in the, in the, in the domain of uh, sustainability. Uh, former IPCC member, vice chair, and uh, he, we are uh, strongly cooperating and contributing to this working, working group, actually. Then you have the recent Loi de la Programmation de la Recherche pour les années uh, 21 to 30. So it's the law which indicates the pathway we should follow for the next 10 years. Uh, and uh, this education to sustainability becomes part of the code de l'éducation. So it's in the law and we have to do it, actually. What we don't know, even if you warmly welcome those initiatives and the political recognition of the importance of sustainability for everyone, what we don't know and what we still need to invent is the how to. How can we go there? How can we do this? We think that teaching needs to be linked to research, which makes the education higher or academic actually, and the academic community needs the recognition of this necessary research education link in order to accept this political invitation. So it should become an opportunity for innovation, open-mindedness, inclusiveness, not only for students, but for all of us. And it's possible, of course, in a transdisciplinary and internationally shared vision. Then the second point I wish to make is linked to the other of the priorities of uh, the committee. Our actions need to be exemplary. It is meant to be so for the universities as demonstrators for sustainability beyond the environmental aspects. Uh, we need to cooperate to engage with the private sector, of course, to include local, regional, national governments in this project. And we have to have a shareable political vision of a sustainable future. Well, technically, it started with a large program financed by national, regional and local public-private partnerships to renovate our university's campuses. For instance, the main campus of my home institution, University Toulouse Jean Jaurès, was entirely renovated in the last 10 years and is now more than meeting the environmental standards for low greenhouse gas emission, low energy consumption and so on. Thing, one thing we still need to learn once more, is uh, how to use the tool we have now. So the thing is there, the tool is there, but the how to is still to invent and we have to uh, reflect more on human behavior, actually. Well, this fact puts into light another very important point. Sustainability is more than just acting, acting environmental friendly. It includes in particular social and or societal aspects as we understand it. And those will be the most challenging issues, of course, for the next years of transition. No, one short example uh, linked to the team of the panel as the pandemic acted as an accelerator here. The most visible and direct impact of the pandemic is clearly our remote way of working. Well, at the first glance, it is all positive. We lowered the greenhouse gas emission because we did not travel anymore, nor even go to our working places, we saved money to which is partly to be reinvested in uh, for financing uh, project linked to sustainable development and for some of us it opened also new spaces for national european international cooperation no matter how far you are from others zoom helps to get closer to each other in the first time it all seemed rather positive and it could be but and here is once again the same challenge it is not that easy tools are there Mariela. So, we are, sorry, uh, yeah. I'm, I'm, okay. I'm done in. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, the thing is that uh, we still have to use and there are new questions that arise from all of those tools. 
it is uh, okay we have good tools but we need to be more social and we need to learn how to use those tools we have zoom but zoom may never replace some personal meetings we need this contact too we may not be really efficient uh, even when it comes to sdgs if we just rely on the tools and we forget the social impacts of all of this so one well, the last uh, the conclusion of all this for uh, in the vision of uh, of the committee I'm, I'm here for is that the pandemic's consequence is that the former normal no longer exists and rather than being a threat we should think uh, about it like uh, more than an opportunity, especially for advancing sustainability through human-centered innovation and creativity. And that's what we are actually working on when getting in touch with all of the other, uh, all of the political uh, decision makers, actually. So. Thank you so much, Gabriella. I very much on behalf of the entire panel and Stefan as well, I think we really appreciate the way that you've really established and set the, the table, so to speak, for, for this panel discussion. Uh, my name is Michelle Wyman. Um, together with Stefan, I really want to extend my appreciation to all of you, all of our panelists and speakers and attendees for being a part of this symposium. It's now my privilege to introduce our next panel speaker, Joni Mahoney, who serves as the president of the State University of New York College of Environmental Science and Forestry. Uh, we refer to that as SUNY ESF. And uh, this particular college, and I think this is noteworthy for our colleagues listening, and particularly across, across the pond and other places, um, the State University of New York system is made up of 64 different campuses. And ESF is one of the leading campuses within SUNY. We are absolutely thrilled, again, to have Joni with us as the president of SUNY ESF. The last point that I'll share before I pass it over to you, President Mahoney, is that prior to your appointment as president, you served for 11 years as a county executive. And we've heard this morning a lot of the opportunity around and the importance of boundary spanning, which is essentially the work of the mission of our organization, GCSE, the role of, sub, of, of science and evidence to inform environmental decision making. And, and it is particularly important to underscore the possibilities that exist between academic science and the science enterprise and local governments as we consider sustainability and the ongoing impacts from climate change. Over to you, President Mahoney. Uh, thank you very much, Michelle. And thank you, uh, Gabriella, as Michelle said, for setting the table so well for our panel and our discussion. I have the very good fortune of serving as president of the SUNY uh, Environmental Science and Forestry College. And um, we have a mission that is focused very uh, clearly on the environment, on um, environmental science and forestry. And everyone is here with this um, common goal to heal the planet, to take care of the planet. And so it does make for a setting where collaboration and um, cross-cutting areas of research are possible because everybody's research is in some way related to the environment. So we're very lucky to have that mission, especially here at this moment of time. in time. ESF has been a leading voice in environmental science since it was founded in 1911. I also um, come with a little bit of a different perspective, as Michelle said, because I come from a role in government where I had the ability to affect policy. And I now can say from my seat at ESF, the college, um, the kinds of things that people in positions to um, create policy need to hear and how it that message can be delivered in a way that can uh, translate to the things that we all know that we need and have known for some time that we need. Here at ESF, I was interested to hear Rita's comments earlier today, Rita Caldwell, 
um, we have scientists here on campus that have um, researched the ways to find COVID in wastewater and ring alarm bells before we have a breakout. Those kinds of things happening here and then hearing that they're happening in other places, an organization like this, GSCE, can bring us together so we can be communicating and problem solving together and you know, speeding up that process where we can be delivering the science to inform the policies that are being created. Um, I'll just tell you that we're doing it in a couple different ways. The question was um, at one point, you know, should this be top down? Should this be bottom up? I would humbly suggest it needs to be both. Uh, ESF scientists are participating on the um, CLCPA, which is New York State's leading climate act. And they will, in a very formal way, be participating in the policies that are being created. Uh, so we're very lucky to have our voice there at that table. There's incredible research being done here at ESF, but it needs to translate. We need to um, expand the boundaries as we've heard. And so I can give you a little example. And part of the reason that I think it needs to be bottom up as well is because, um, and, and Gabrielle, you talked about the size of your membership. There's a lot of power in that number of people. And we need to educate the public to the extent that they will apply, apply the pressure that our policymakers need to, um, to make these uh, kinds of changes. It's the local level that has control over our water, our land use planning, our transportation, how we develop renewable energy projects. I had the good fortune as county executive to be involved in a transition from very energy intensive gray solutions to our wastewater issues and moved to a greener solution. And I did it because we had the SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry here in our community and they were able to vouch for the things we were doing and we ended up with very conservative politicians who are all about low taxes and small government clamoring for more green infrastructure and more money being spent on these kinds of projects so i'll leave you with that and hope maybe we can talk more in the q a um, um thank you joanny um uh, it's good to share this experience that you have that having been part of the policymakers and today, today being part of the academic uh, community. So thank you to share uh, these uh, few words with us so far. Um, I would like to introduce um, Olivier Dangle. Olivier Dangle is uh, the deputy chief scientist uh, of the National Institute of Research for Sustainable Development. Uh, Olivier will tell us about transition go going on within uh, IRD, uh, maybe in terms of uh, research orientations. Um, but you, you, in your research work yourself, I mean, you, you have had, uh, you have this, uh, you have been very much involved with sustain sustainability science, focusing on the response of biodiversity to global uh, changes. So maybe today you will tell us more about um, what your institute is doing regarding all these aspects. So Olivier, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Stéphane. And thank you everybody for being here and, and for the invitation. Um, uh, that was really great to prepare this talk and to have this kind of, uh, to scratch my head about the question by uh, Stefan, what will you do in 10 years and what is the plan that you have? So yes, I would like to, to give you a kind of perspective from my institution, which is the French Research Institute for uh, Research and Development. And I'm talking on behalf of my uh, CEO, Valérie Verdier, who is not uh, present today, but I would like to, to share with you some, uh, a couple of messages. Uh, following slide, next slide. So I just wanted to, to share with you this cover. This is the cover of the science magazine uh, last October. And this is a very um, important cover. Uh, actually, it was a cover which was done uh, during, of course, the election in the United States, but also during the pandemics and during the maelstrom of the pandemics. And that was a, um, a cover and an editorial that were really important because 
uh, it really showed that scientific facts are not enough. This is what we saw during the pandemics. We saw a lot of information from science and we also saw that the dynamics of the people, of the societies, the beliefs and all this stuff is really important in the way we uh, face crisis. And that was something which was really important in the editorial and the, and the editorial in chief of Science Magazine was advocating that the scientific community should be involved in all this political and social dialogue. And they were a bit, um, a press about this, and, and here is an excerpt of the editorial readers who don't think science and its published peers should write about politics, often tell us stick to science. We are sticking to science, but more importantly, we are sticking up for science. And that was really strong because that shows, as uh, Gabriela said, that we now need a science a research community, which is even more involved in the reality of the societies. So based on this, on this introduction, I just would like to share five take-home messages that we have from the IRD. So the first take-home message is that in view of all these global crises and, and the state of the planet, we need to go forward globally and also reflectively with regard to SDG. I, I'm just trying to explain. So we have this kind of planetary issues and we have some very useful SDGs that are like a compass that can help um, um, making the link between um, societies, governments, and science. But we need to be reflexive in it, and we need to read the 169 targets behind the SDGs. Because if we only keep the SDGs, it's only some broad words. So we need to think reflectively as a scientific community, what does it mean? Then there is the uh, GSDR, which is its very important report about the role of science in um, um, going toward the sustainable development goals. That should be a report that should be shared in all the universities and other IOD who are making some studies about this to really think what we can do about this. We also need to think about the ethical partnership. Uh, how to save the planet is not only a matter of uh, industrial country. We need to take the lessons of the global south. The, it is really rich in systemic lessons and we need to give the voice of these uh, countries to be able to share a common future. And, and the last point is that we need to have, I think, a kind of social contract of the researcher, which is now well alive. I mean, our kids are in the street to fight against climate change. We are on, on also fathers, not only scientists, and we need to move about this. We need to renew our social contract. The second take home message I would like to share with you is like we really need to invent new ways of doing science to break silos. We still have a lot of silos in the, in the university and in our institution. And there is a lot of uh, new, uh, an emergence of very interesting initiative to be able to share knowledge among scientists of different disciplines, but also between scientists and communities. So we have some community of practices. We have some community of knowledge at IOD, for example, where we have a shared knowledge between researchers and uh, people from the thousand countries. We have the Fab Lab, which are like very exciting and innovative labs where creativity is really important to fix some quick problems. We are building now um, with an international relationship, the Just One Tenant Lab, which is a kind of initiative we are supporting at IOD, which is basically to, to, to connect people who have some skills and other people who have some problems and try to make them discussing to solve some really uh, great issue. Uh, in the United States also, we have a very um, incredible initiative at the MIT, which is the SOLVE initiative, where you can see, for example, how uh, with a very pragmatic view of the engineer, we try to solve problems in every part of the countries. And also, there are also the knowledge action networks, for example, in the Future Earth web, which is basically to try to understand how we come from knowledge to action and what we're doing in this translation. The third message that I had, um, and this is something that uh, Stefan talked about, is to change our day-to-day -day research practices. This is really important at every level. At an institutional level, it's really important that the processes and the structure of our institution evolve based on how the world is going and based on the uh, next objective for, to, to save the planet, more or less. And there is this very nice initiative, the Research Finance Initiative, which is a kind of uh, tool, global tool, so that the institution can reflect about how they put in practice some procedures, some uh, spaces to be able to think about how to make a 
much fair um, uh, investigation in the future. So IID, for example, is applying this initiative to his institution, and this is really rich for our uh, reflection about this. About the travels, of, of course, um, Gabriela told about this and, and the way that the COVID has changed everything. And in the IID, for example, at the IID, we have developed a new game, a serious game to have people and researchers playing together to try to see how they can uh, save some carbon credits within a team. So not only thinking myself, what I'm doing, I'm going to this PhD thesis, to this symposium, but to share and to, um, to try to manage a global uh, carbon footprint at the level of a lab. So this is really some new things that we need to support. We are thinking about also the, 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 the life cycle of the products, not only carbon, but also all the products that we use in the investigation. And what are they uh, ecological, but also social footprints. And in France, in INRAE, for example, we have a very strong um, knowledge about how to measure uh, these, uh, these, these footprints. And of course, in meetings, uh, there was a kind of revolution of how to do e-meetings. And that was really important because that can fit also to the sustainable development goals. Like, for example, the gender balance, the low carbon, the diversity of voices, and the fact that we share in all continents the knowledge. So these are really important targets for the SDG, and we can do it by changing the way we do research. My fourth uh, message uh, this is a message that really, really are, this is very important for the IID because our institution is working mainly in the intertropical region. And we think that we really need to reinforce our ethics of collaboration with the Global South. These are like two papers that I just take from the literature. There are many of them, even in the recent years, that kind of point uh, to the still pervasive um, influence of helicopter research, which is basically to go in one country to do some research and to go back and publish and do all the stuff. And we really think that we need some more collaboration. The SDG number 17, which is the partnership for the global, uh, for, for the realization, for meeting the global objective is really important. And it says that we need to enhance the North South collaboration and South South collaboration. And at the ID, for example, we are committed 60% of our publication in cooperation with the Global South. So we don't really, we never almost publish uh, alone. We want to involve uh, all the time our partners. And finally, my fifth and last message. Um, I come back to, I go back to, to, to Science Journal um, uh, because we are like in a discussion between uh, United States and France. And I think that we would need to rethink how we measure excellence. Actually today, at least in France, excellence is mainly about uh, uh, your personal visibility from outside. It's about your papers. It's about your altimetrics. It's about your H index. It's about all the things. And still, uh, this is very important, the way we measure excellence among scientists. If we now want to change, and if we want the researcher to change their way of doing research, maybe in taking more time to do all these socially important uh, activities and to meet the sustainable development goals, we need to try to rethink about how we measure excellence. And that was a, a, another um, uh, editorial in the, in the science journal, the excellence question. And there was this uh, important message, the system in place for defining excellence are not sufficiently open-minded. I really think that we need innovation I think that we need to think about how to change the world. So we need to be really open-minded and we need to think about how the academy has to transform itself to be able to meet this challenge. Thank you. I think you so effectively and efficiently uh, just captured uh, really the purpose and the inspiration behind this entire symposium. So more for the discussion once we've heard from our final panelist, it's my privilege to introduce Gil Latz, who currently serves as the Vice Provost for Global Strategies and International Affairs to the Ohio State University. Um, as the Vice Provost, uh, his research oversees an entire body of work that captures transdisciplinary opportunities and he'll share a bit about with all of us how that specifically corresponds with the discussions we've been having during this symposium. It's, it's my privilege now to pass it over to you, Gil. Thank you. Thank you, 
Michelle. Uh, it's an honor to be here. I want to echo what the other uh, presenters have said about the excellence of the symposium. And uh, I've already learned a lot uh, just in the last hour or so from each of the panelists, which I'm grateful for. Um, I want to make sure we have some time for uh, questions from the audience. I'll try and be brief. Uh, my uh, my focus is really on uh, a case example of how at The Ohio State University, through strategic planning, we've adopted an ambitious goal to modernize our campus in terms of its energy efficiency. Uh, and that is uh, something that other universities are doing, of course. Uh, ours is an exemplary model, which I will talk about somewhat now, but also uh, in the Q&A and beyond today's discussion so that we keep this at a rather high level. Uh, but what's also interesting about this collaboration to reduce our energy and carbon footprint is that we're doing it with a French company, Angie, and its partner Axiom Infrastructure. Uh, and this uh, public-private uh, partnership or university-community partnership uh, is directly related to energy supply, sustainability goals, optimization of energy use to limit environmental impact. Uh, the presentation relates, I think, of course, to the Academic Research Institution Advancing Sustainability theme of the symposium. I had the privilege of being on the executive committee uh, with uh, several uh, of the speakers and, and our two moderators today. One of the themes we talked about there was institutional operations and facilities management in campus environments. Stefan mentioned this in his remarks a minute ago. Uh, and this partnership uh, on energy is, uh, I think, an important example. It gets directly at the boundary spanning question that uh, uh, was presented from day one. Uh, it also, uh, it, it specifically relates to some of the preceding comments today. And uh, in addition to what we've heard, I wanna remind everyone that on day one, the president, another university president uh, with uh, joint, joining President Mahoney was Graham Carr of Concordia University, Montreal. And he talked about initiatives for uh, Concordia, uh, which included creating an ecosystem of sustainability through science and action. Uh, and it leads me to then, uh, in summary of my introduction, pose the question, what's the potential for increased collaboration between the United States and French universities and companies to achieve desired results in the sustainability area? In other words, is the example that we're pursuing here generalizable beyond uh, the context of uh, one university in one city, in one state, in one country? So uh, just a quick review uh, for those of you who are not familiar with uh, Angie, uh, it's, a, it's a very large exemplary uh, low carbon energy services organization. It has 170,000 employees. It has a purpose uh, to seek to reconcile economic performance with uh, the positive impact on people on the planet. And they do this through gas, renewable energy and other services. Uh, operating in 70 countries, early adopter of the fight against climate change, uh, overall focusing on low carbon activities. Axiom Infrastructure is the independent infrastructure investment firm focused on investments for uh, the, the, the parent company. Ohio State, the, the third partner, uh, we're a land grant institution established in 1870, uh, a beneficiary of the Morrell Act. Uh, and decisions made by the Link, Abraham Lincoln administration. Uh, this was an effort in the United States to uh, develop federally supported post-secondary education that originally focused on agriculture and engineering. And institutions like Ohio State have a history of addressing through research, teaching and engagement, the local, national and global challenges facing society. Uh, we have a large campus, one of the largest in the United States, 2,000 acres, uh, one of the largest institutions of higher learning, 68,000 students, um, and uh, we're one of the two largest comprehensive land-grant institutions with seven health science colleges among our 15 colleges. 
uh, top 12 uh, US public university, number three in industry sponsored research. We have many graduate programs in the top 10 nationally. Uh, we've been uh, recognized by the Association for the Advancement of Sustainability in Higher Education as a top tier institution. We've developed a sustainability institute, which I represent today. Uh, that Sustainability Institute has chronicled that we have about a thousand courses now related to global, local uh, communities in terms of sustainability. The Sustainability Institute leads the campus operations uh, question that uh, gets at this energy efficiency. Um, it approaches sustainability in a very comprehensive fashion. It's a, it's a hard science and a humanities and a social scientific question uh, which brings together our researchers. We adopted our goals in 2015. Uh, and uh, in the Q&A, if there's interest in, in learning more about our institute, I'd be happy to discuss it. So very briefly in conclusion, the energy goals that we're talking about through this venture uh, with corporation is aimed to improve energy efficiency by a minimum of 25% within 10 years achieve carbon neutrality by 2050, nurture the next generation of sustainable energy leaders, and serve as an incubator for sustainable energy innovations. And we do this through a, 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 an Ohio State energy partner organization. We have a governance board. Uh, the funding uh, coming from the company not only purchased the power plant, but also provided scholarship funds for research and student uh, internships. Uh, we look at, at all the operational aspects of the university. We look at the supply of energy. Uh, and of course, as I just said, the academic collaboration, uh, which in addition to supporting faculty research and student internships, uh, is in the process of creating an energy advancement and innovation center, which will bring our community of campus uh, leaders and students and staff and the community including local entrepreneurs and industry experts to look at the next generation of smart energy systems, renewable energy and green mobility solutions. And the, the partnership of, with Ohio State and Angie and others has committed $50 million for that project, including a new building. So I'll stop at that point. Um, I, I, again, I'm posing the question, um, are there generalizations? Can we, can we expand on this idea? Uh, and uh, I see it as a boundary spanning example of working together from the academy out into the business sector and into the community in which we reside. And I think it has uh, much potential because it develops metrics for efficiency, which measure progress toward goal, which are so important as all the speakers have said today, if we're going to address the urgent problems uh, that we now face. Thank you. But thank you very much, Jill, for this. Um, well, you gave an example of uh, already a good partnership. It looks, sounds like a good partnership between France and the US, um, between uh, academic community and uh, academic institution and the private sector. Um, we are already running very short <laughs> with the with these sessions. Not much time left for questions. But uh, so we, uh, I have uh, one question to start, and I will be uh, very short. So, well, it was discussed before, everybody mentioned it, but uh, we had this COVID experience. And regarding the agenda that we face for uh, to, to preserve our planet, I mean, this COVID uh, experience maybe accelerate the awareness or maybe the ecological transition within academic or research institutions. So what could you give like one example of what, uh, of, uh, the, the first impact, what, what you have in, uh, in mind following or during this pandemic. I don't know if it's after or during the pandemic. I don't know how to say that. So maybe I ask Gabriela first and maybe we can go the same uh, the way you, you spoke afterwards. Gabriela? I will be short on this. The most significant uh, impact we remember from the pan pandemic is the empty campuses. We have a tremendous, we have a perfect tools, very good tools. We have empty campuses. Empty campuses means uh, no life, no social life. 
and no more inclusion in the society. And sustainability for us, well, the pandemic brought the sustainability to the, to the forefront of political concerns, which is very good. It showed that we have a lot of tools, which is very good. And it showed also that we need more social, uh, more to reflect on the social part of sustainability, on the inclusiveness, on the open-mindedness, and of going beyond boundaries in order to learn how to imagine a future that is and will be different from what we have had until now. Joni? Uh, thank you. Uh, I would echo what Gabriella said about the first thing that comes to mind <laughs> the empty campuses. Um, but COVID really made the world smaller and illustrated for people that we are all in this together. There were no boundaries that COVID was respecting. So we couldn't have different policies for different geographic boundaries. Um, it, you know, it didn't matter if the people, um, you know, somewhere else weren't abiding by the COVID protocols, it was going to affect all of us. Um, and I think that's a healthy thing for people to remember going forward is we are all in this together. We can't have some parts of the world addressing climate change. It's going to take all of us and it's going to take an organization like GSCE to pull us all together. ESF will offer ourselves as somebody that will um, take a role as you see fit in implementing the action items that come from this. Um, but I would say COVID making the world smaller has also had a silver lining in that, you know, we can collaborate because we don't all have to be in the same room. And we've seen that in the last year. And so there's, there's a bigger role for organizations like this because you can pull us all together without having us all have to be in the same room. So for that, I'm grateful. Thank you. Yes, uh, maybe for me, uh, one of the very concrete actions that was after the pandemic was the development of the Prezold project. So this is a very international project that we that was um, pushed by the French government, by our um, uh, president, um, Emmanuel Macron, uh, with uh, especially with Germany. And this is a very global initiative to support really the science-based transition towards adapted and resilient socio-ecosystems. So the, the idea is to reduce the risk of zoonotic emergence uh, by increasing biodiversity and fighting against poverty. So we have both uh, axes of the, of, the, of the problem. And what Prezel wants to do is to develop a kind of large framework of the, for the international coordination. And for example, the EcoHealth Alliance, which is an, an alliance uh, mainly based in the United States, is part of this, uh, of this initiative. And they will also want to, to build a platform for sharing knowledge. We were talking about this, I remember this afternoon with Jean-Francois Susanna, for example, he was reflecting the need of a uh, collaboration platform to share with the uh, society. And also to have a kind of online resource center for decision makers uh, to be able to, to make some changes in terms of public policies. So this is a very integrated project that came after the COVID uh, pandemic or even during, to, and, and we want to involve our partners from the South, the whole community, and also the whole society uh, to the fight of, the, of this pandemic and maybe the next pandemics. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, it's an excellent question. And I'll add to what others have said, uh, particularly President Mahoney. Uh, I, I was really struck by how the problem we had to confront reinforced the value I place on education. So one of the ways we think about the purpose and mission of a land-grant university like the Ohio State University is that we work on issues that are the most challenging of any issue facing the world. And this is an example of that. Uh, but if we're going to do that, it isn't only science to action and boundary spanning and um, addressing some of uh, the public misunderstanding or uh, positioning on this issue of the um, threat represented by COVID-19, but it's also graduating the next generation of leaders who can think about these complex issues, address them thoughtfully as citizens, 
and and persuade those who may not agree on on a unified path forward. Uh, so the way in which the not only the science and the research but the curriculum is going to influence how we think about this problem through the emerging leadership represented by our graduates, I think really came home to me in a powerful way uh, in the time away from the campus, as a matter of fact. Thank you. Thank you all so much. In the spirit of time, we are committed, particularly for our colleagues uh, joining us from across the Atlantic to staying on point. Um, I want to underscore that all of your questions are being captured for those of you that post questions that haven't been answered. Uh, also, we are recording all of the panels and the keynote speakers and will be sending out um, a completely edited link so you can hear all of these again. Um, by the end of this symposium today, we will share details on how to participate in a sustained community of practice so you can maintain engagement. And I very much hope that all of you joining us will consider participating in that. Um, I don't believe, should we do one more question? What do you all think? One more question? Okay, all right, so one more question. And I think we have, we have heard uh, from all of you um, broad goals and intent based on what we have all learned and you've learned specifically um, during the pandemic. Uh, we would love to hear, not to put you on the spot, but a specific concrete change that will be permanent and positive based on what you've learned institutionally um, during the pandemic and for, for all of you in leadership capacities. Uh, what, what specific thing will you change and, and retain for certain going forward? Well, I, I step in at the first one, even if I maybe don't have the best example. Uh, actually, I will talk about my home institution because uh, to be in concrete, I need to speak up of my home institution, Tuition University to do, Toulouse Jean Jaurès. Uh, one thing we will keep is uh, the remote work and the possibility for some of us, for those who wish to share uh, from remote and on-site work actually and to have new hybrid ways of working and of teaching too. So it's innovation, it's innovation in the way we work and it's innovation in the way we teach and I do join Jill on the importance of uh, what we have to do on teaching and how we have to give something to the, to the future actually. Um, and I would say that there's a couple things. One is that we saw in other ways besides COVID, the benefit of people staying away when they don't feel well. And we'd like to make it possible continuing for people, you know, we're, we pride ourselves at ESF on being an in-person institution with some um, opportunities for field work and we collaborate and we're very close physically, but we wanna make sure that we have the opportunity for people that have symptoms to be able to participate remotely when necessary. And I think before this, people felt pressure to power through and be around each other. And we're gonna take that a lot more seriously um, the other thing is we're going to participate in organizations like this because we now know, as I said in the last question, you know, we can collaborate. We can turn our computers on and the ocean goes away and we can be together with colleagues in France and really share ideas and learn from each other. And we're going to do that deliberately going forward. Um, I think that the pandemic, what, what I retain about this is about uh, the concept of boundary, planetary boundary. That was a clear um, vision, a clear um, example of how we overpassed the boundary of our planets. 
I mean, in particular about biodiversity and about the integrity of the ecosystems. And I think that the word boundary is really important um, to think how we're going to manage the future. We need to put the boundary first, and then we need to be really uh, uh, strong and very creative to find some way of building a safe operating space within the boundaries. And to create a space, we need some transboundary collaboration. So this is exactly what Joanne said. We need to increase more collaboration among people and to, to try to make this uh, silo and this uh, the small chapel here and the other people there uh, working more together. So that would be the two main keywords that I have, boundary and transboundary. And I'll just say that as the fourth speaker, final speaker here, commentator, uh, I, I think the idea that, that GCSC has come up with about a community of practice is extremely important. And it, I didn't think of it necessarily before uh, during the, during the uh, pandemic, although it's widely practiced as a, as a teaching, learning and research tool on university campuses. But the idea that a nonprofit organization who sees its role as informing uh, policymakers and the public about science and is willing to say that it wants to support extensive and, and extended research over time uh, is, is encouraging because that's what we need. We can't be ad hoc. We have to not just have our focus on one thing one month or one year and our focus on something else the next. This is a problem that requires sustained research and action. And I think that the, uh, this idea of a community of practice and finding other funders uh, in public and private sector who can support the community of practice over an extended period of time is vital to the aims of this Trans-Pacific Symposium. Thank you all so much for your expertise, for sharing your leadership. Uh, we will have additional input based on what you shared um, when Stefan and I close the symposium. For now, really please accept our gratitude. I will pass over the mic, so to speak, back to Erica Goldman.